Welcome to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. Thank you guys for tuning in today. This is episode 101. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. Um, we're, we're happy here at the show to have hit 100 episodes. The show's almost two years old, and God's really blessed um, this ministry as reaching uh, people through the digital platforms while we can still exist on these platforms to change minds, change hearts, and save lives at a very propitious moment when the political winds have certainly changed, <laughs> to put it lightly, for the pro-life movement um, and our pre-born neighbors. Um, we have a very special episode for you today. Um, our guest is Monica Klein. Now, Monica is a former Title X uh, family planning training manager and volunteer educator for Planned Parenthood. So she has been behind enemy lines, and uh, God woke her up to what she was complicit in and now is using her in an incredible way um, to help uh, where she would admit she used to hurt and, uh, and, and saving both uh, preborn children as well as children who have been and are being indoctrinated by probably the biggest proponent of the culture of death. Planned Parenthood. She was trained in HIV prevention, education, and comprehensive sex education, and we'll get into what that euphemism means. And during this time, uh, Monica came to learn that her quote-unquote uh, mentors that were serving the marginalized were only meeting them where they were at, but then leaving them there. Uh, and when she began to question this comprehensive sex education and quote-unquote, crisis pregnancy counseling, she was told that if she wasn't pro-abortion, she didn't belong there. Well, today she exposes the truth behind comprehensive sex education, the harm it causes to children's families and communities, and her goal is to encourage parents to reclaim parenthood and become their children's greatest advocates and educators as nature and nature's God intended. She equips families with the resources and skills to strengthen family trust and confidence. And today she does all of that as the founder and director of It Takes a Family. And I couldn't think of a better title for her organization. So you are going to enjoy this episode. If you listen to this with your children, however, we would like to put a uh, maybe a PG-13 or higher um, warning on this episode today. We're going to talk about some graphic stuff because the culture of death is indeed graphic. All that and more, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Well, Monica, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Seth. I'm really excited to be on your show today. Yes, thank you for making the time. We, we so appreciate you, your voice, and your ministry um, standing in the highway of the culture of death and screaming to the country, stop, <laughs> and giving parents resources on, right. on, 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 on how to help us stop and how to engage lovingly. So firstly, for our listeners, uh, many of whom are not sort of pro-life activists, if you will, they're just concerned Christians, young people, pastors and, and parents um, who want to stand in this culture of death. Just tell us your story. Start wherever you want, but tell us kind of your history and involvement and where God's brought you today. Oh, goodness. Yeah, well, that is quite a story. Um, well, uh, you know, I'll preface it all with just saying that I, you know, came from a very small town in southern Texas, the southern tip of Texas, traditional Mexican-American family, and we had really strong family values, but we did not practice a, you know, the Christian religion. So we, you know, when I went to college at the University of Texas at Austin, I was very much, um, you know, molded by the culture that was there. And of course, this was in the 90s. So HIV was something that was of great concern. And um, so by the time I graduated UT, I decided to volunteer for an organization. And I, I you know, being young, like most young people, we want to impact the world. We want to do something that's important. Um, I want to work, you know, I wanted to work with marginalized communities. I had worked with children who'd been abused and, and I wanted to do something that really impacted the community. And in that time, it was working with people living with HIV or teaching how, you know, the community, how to prevent uh, the, the transmission of HIV. So I right. found myself volunteering and then quickly hired by a gay organization. And that is where it all began at the Austin Latino, Latina, lesbian and gay organization in Austin, in Texas. Hmm. And so what, what, where did God take you from there in terms of um, your involvement with uh, Planned Parenthood, with uh, sex education, particularly during the, uh, the HIV uh, epidemic? 
Well, you know, as soon as I was hired by them, they started teaching me how to uh, teach HIV prevention to the community. And then they said, you know, it's really time for you to learn how to send this message or share this message with children as well. So they sent me across the street to Planned Parenthood and the director of sex education sat me down um, and became my mentor on how to teach comprehensive sexuality education to children and to the community. And this is where it gets a little bit more graphic, but this is really important because, you know, the things that she taught me in this first meeting with her Really, I like to, to let people know that this is really the philosophy that undergirds comprehensive sexuality education. And through this, you'll understand how it grooms children not only to have sex as minors, but how to dehumanize the preborn child. So she sat me down and she made the case for comprehensive sexuality education. And she said, we have girls coming in as young as 10. They're coming in with sexually transmitted diseases. They're coming in to get abortions. And in some of them, some cases, we're even having objects removed from their little bodies. And this really shocked me. And I said, you know, you're, you're telling me something that's obviously these, these girls are so young. They're, in my mind, I was thinking they're being abused. This is not right. How can we teach these girls to avoid sexual situations? I, it, I wasn't blaming them but I did want to teach them to not be sexually active and how we could pr protect those who obviously were being abused. Well, right. she quickly patted me, patted me on the knee and she said, no, dear, we're not going to teach them not to be sexually active. We're just going to teach them how to do it safer. We meet them where they're at and we wow. just teach them how to do it safer. She also said, now, if you ever tell these children that they should not be sexually active, then you will be judging them and they're going to feel judged and you're going to make them feel bad. And that's the last thing we want to do because we want them wow. to keep coming to the clinic so they can get tested and treated and have their, you know, unplanned pregnancy, the, you know, have their abortions. Um, wow. I, I didn't like her answer, but she <laughs> made the case and said, listen, they're going to do this anyway. And if we're not here for them, who will be there for them? So wow. she kind of really put me in a position to think, well, okay, then I guess she's right. So then the next lesson that she taught me was when you walk into a room full of children, a classroom full of children, you need to imagine that they've done anything and everything when it comes to sex. And if they haven't, they will. And it's your job as a comprehensive sexuality educator wow. to teach them all forms of sex and how they can protect themselves, you know, in, in those different scenarios. And, you know, so this, I want to pause here, Seth, and I want your listeners to understand that this is the foundational beliefs of this type of education. Hmm. They believe that children are sexual from birth, which is something that they learned from Alfred Kinsey. Right. Um, and you can look up who he is, you know, later. Um, they believe that they're sexual from birth. And what you're seeing today through the Planned Parenthood, International Federation, local, you know, even the one here in the United States, FECAS, Advocates for Youth, all of these allies, they believe that children are sexual from birth and that they have sexual rights to sexual pleasure. So they're wow. trying to equate sexual rights with human rights. And when we think about human rights, that means that there is an oppressor that is trying to, you right. know, to impede on the rights of a person. So if we begin to believe as a culture that children have sexual rights, Seth, here's my question to you. Who in all the world would want, it would be the oppressor. Who, who in all the world would be the person who would want to stop children from being sexually active? Right. Most of the time, the audience will tell me parents. Parents don't want their children to be sexually active. So really, this philosophy that children are sexual from birth and have sexual rights basically wow. is saying that parents are the oppressor. And yep. what we're seeing, not only in what Planned Parenthood taught me, but what we're seeing in bills that are being created by the pro-abortion um, community, as well as the transgender community and the LGBTQ community, even the medical community, they want children and adolescents to have medical confidentiality. They want children to be able to access healthcare services, quote unquote, healthcare services without parental consent. 
So really the parent and the family, the nuclear family, or even single parent families are being demonized and our rights are being taken away, which is why through my organization, it takes a family. I tell parents, I want to prepare you to be a leader in your home, in your community, and in policy, because if the laws change that take your rights away as a parent, then these people and organizations wow. will be able to do anything they want with the children. Right. Unreal. My goodness. Thank you for sharing that, because I think this is something a lot of people don't understand, is that the party of death is always looking for a victim class so that they can position themselves as the savior with the solution. And so this time, the victim class for them is minors, and the oppressor are the parents and the pro-life movement writ large. Those pesky pro-lifers who actually believe in science, that human life begins at the moment of conception. Boys can't be girls and girls can't be boys. And as you well know, and you can feel free to share this and dive into this if you'd like, Planned Parenthood is also a huge provider of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. So they're going to target children with sexual propaganda to sexualize them early so that they eventually get abortions, but also to target those who have gender dysphoria with their medical solutions. And they'd love to provide those without the consent of the parents. So, uh, I mean, these are all just results of the culture of death, of course. But you've mentioned before, Monica, that some of Planned Parenthood's quote-unquote educational resources have connections with what is essentially child pornography with some of the groups that they actually point individuals to for this learning and for this education. Do you want to share anything about that? Absolutely. So if, if anyone chooses to dig in a little bit into the services of Planned Parenthood, um, and especially the services and education that they provide young people, you will quickly find that their additional resources always lead to pornography um, and in different forms. Wow. And so, so, for example, not I'm not wanting to advertise any books, but these are some common books. Um, this first book that I want to uh, mention is called Perfectly Normal by Robbie Harris. Now, I met Robbie Harris when I was teaching um, at a Planned Parenthood conference many years ago in Waco, Texas, and mm -hmm. she had just come out with her book called Perfectly Normal, and she gave us free copies. Now, this book is in your children's libraries and public schools. I don't know if they're also in private schools and Christian schools, but from my understanding, from many of my colleagues, this book has also been present in private schools and possibly even Christian schools. So look for a book called Perfectly Normal. And it is, I, I, I use this term loosely, it is beautifully illustrated in the sense that the illustrator is very talented, but what they have illustrated is very pornographic. And it literally shows children and encourages children to explore themselves through self-stimulation it shows um, homosexual wow. relationships. It actually shows them, um, and it shows heterosexual relationships. It goes on and on and on. I mean, it, it is a pretty lengthy book showing all of this to children and calling it good. Wow. Um, another common book that many comprehensive sexuality programs refer to is a book called Scarletine, and that is very graphic. It is into fetish mode, quite honestly. It, it talks wow. about blood play. It talks about BDSM. And Jeez. it's for teenagers. Uh, and it is, it, it is what that Planned Parenthood director taught me, is to imagine that these children are involved in anything and everything. And if they're not, they will be. So their goal is to expose children to all forms of sexual activity, the most dangerous forms, all of it. Um, wow. One of the things that she also told me is to, even though on one hand she's telling me that these children are so sexually active, on the other hand, she also told me that they're very inhibited. Okay, that didn't make a lot of sense. But she basically said one of the first things you need to do in class is reduce their inhibition so that you can talk to them about sexual activity. And so that first icebreaker is to have the children shout out the slang names for body parts, which, as you can imagine, Seth, becomes very graphic and oh very gosh. crass. And after a while, when the children notice that the authority in the classroom, which is that sex educator, 
is encouraging yeah. them and they're not in trouble, they begin to participate, even the quiet ones do. And what's left on the on the board, the whiteboard, is just this collage of dehumanizing terms about their bodies. And they wow. giggle and they laugh. And then, you know, then it just kind of opens the door to allow them to absorb more information uh, about sexuality. And as, as you realize what's happening here is that comprehensive sexuality education is what grooms children for sexual activity as minors. Hmm. It teaches them to dehumanize themselves and one another through right. treating sex as just for pleasure, like a material thing, like your body is just a material thing. Right. And so it's just a natural next step for these children to then dehumanize the preborn child through abortion. Hmm. So it becomes this cycle for them wow. with comprehensive sexuality education. So imagine again, Planned Parenthood being a business that makes their money off of the testing, the appointments, the abortions, right. all of that. So now that you've groomed this customer to believe to dehumanize themselves, and to seek out abortion, it becomes a cycle because they tell them, Seth, now that you're sexually active, you need to get tested every three to six months for disease. You need right. to come in for pregnancy tests. <clears throat> so now this is a customer that is engaging wow. in high-risk activity, coming yep. into the clinic for testing and treatment, getting an abortion, and then starting that cycle all over again. And let wow. me emphasize, and this is all done confidentially and anonymously so that parents don't find out. As a matter of fact, wow. in my years of working alongside Planned Parenthood, one of the things that they always said to me, and this is why I found it, it takes a family. One quote that they said over and over again in, in our clinic conferences, parents are a barrier to service. They acknowledge yes. that as soon as a parent is involved in the healthcare of their child, they know that they won't see that child again. But Seth, what that also means is that they're acknowledging that family and parents are powerful. We are the greatest mm. authority and protectors and that's influencers right. of our children's lives. And that's why right. I started It Takes a Family, because I want to really support and equip parents to have that trusting relationship with their children so that they're not easily deceived by the world. Right. Wow. That's powerful, Monica. Thank you for sharing that. I. I... I think what our what our, our listeners need to understand. I want you guys to understand this: is that ideas have consequences, and you may think that you're raising your children with your values, but if you're sending them to schools that are teaching this kind of stuff, um, and you're not being informed about it, and you're not being given the option to opt out of it, and you don't know what's happening, then you are playing Russian roulette with your children's values, and you are throwing them to ideological wolves, to people who have an entirely different worldview than you. And as Monica mentioned, if parents are a barrier to service because the child has sexual rights and the parents are the oppressor class, then the parents are bigots and must be prevented from teaching their children their values. And, and this is something that, that you guys need to understand about the left is that they understand that if you can get them while they're young, they'll serve you forever. I mean, the fight for America is really the fight over the posterity of America. The ideas that the next generation holds will be the ideas that own the day and own the country. And so that's why what Monica does is so important is she's contending at that first stage upstream before this type of indoctrination happens and before the really the moral fallout from all of this type of indoctrination happens. And so I think that's why that's so important. Um, Monica, do you want to share with us at all about a little bit more about the worldview behind um, Planned Parenthood and these individuals. So um, you talked about Alfred Kinsey, right? This absolute pervert um, who preyed on, on minors um, be under the guise and, and assumption that Planned Parenthood has, which is that these children have sexual rights um, and experimented on them. Um, do you want to talk any more about that, unpack that for our listeners in terms of the worldview um, uh, sort of bridge between degenerates like Alfred Kinsey and how this is being fleshed out in the sexual education? Absolutely. So Alfred Kinsey, you know, a quote unquote, was a researcher back in the 40s who did some very unethical research on children. He he basically, he and a team of people um, that he even admitted were pedophiles 
experimented with sexual torture on children and then called it good. Um, some people, it, it's such shocking information that most people, you know, don't want to learn about this man. What's so important though is, you know, I did buy his books off of eBay so that I could read his words for myself and look at table 34 for myself, which, which is where he documented, um, I don't even want to say, <laughs> to be yeah. honest, Seth, but he documented basically the torture of children, uh, to even infants. And by just oh looking gosh. at that one table, table 34, then you can see that what he was doing and what he's admitting is that he sexually tortured these children and then said, look, they're sexual from birth. Um, now, when I was at the working at this gay organization and even when I volunteered, uh, worked closely as a collaborator with my parenthood, this is another thing that they always said. Uh, and, and of course, I, I'm using their words they would say, thank God for Alfred Kinsey and his research, because without oh him, we would not have had the, the spectrum of sexuality. <laughs> and so in his research, he basically wanted to prove or support his depravity. Um, he wanted, he basically said that most people are homosexual or that they fall on some spectrum of homosexuality and bisexuality. Um, that because children are sexual from birth, then we have rights to have sexual pleasure at any age and that all of it is healthy. And that's where all wow. of this comes from. That is the foundation, the foundational beliefs of comprehensive mm. sexuality education and the abortion industry. And this includes the transgender movement. Um, and so when, you know, as parents, we are so concerned about so many things in our family's lives, you know, what we buy, our food labels, is our coffee fair trade? We need to do the same thing when it comes to education. What are the foundational beliefs of the education that your child is learning? And Deuteronomy, right. God tells us that we are to teach our children as we go, by the way, as we sit at the table, that is mm. also uh, to me, um, scripturally showing that, that parents are the primary educators. We are to teach yeah. our children. And so even if we are to place our child at a school, and if we choose not to homeschool, if we place them at a school, we cannot then just assume that they're providing them with a good education. We need to find out what their foundational beliefs are. We That's need right. to be involved in that education so that we fully understand what the, our children are being taught because we are the stewards of, over our children. They're our responsibility. So that's that right. that research, I mean, that, I think that just really sums it up is that that is the philosophy of this movement. The reason I left is, is at some point I came to Christ and God began to show me everything that was really happening. But then my last straw was when Planned Parenthood admitted to me that they would not report statutory rape or cases of human trafficking. Uh, oh this was gosh. at a conference. I was trying to teach them about human trafficking. They kept dismissing my message. They kept dismissing the facts that I was trying to teach them about victims of human trafficking and, and, and just everything that, that went along with that. So I finally asked them, why do you refuse to do this? Why do you refuse to see them as victims? And they, this older nurse raised her hand. She said, honey, if that girl's not going to have sex with this man this month, she'll have, be with another one next month. And they all agreed. Wow. And so their view of our children, their view Gosh. of our children and our little girls is that they are sexual beings who are seeking out this sexual activity whether it's with adult men or their uh, or with people their own yeah. age, it was irrelevant to them because they felt that it was their choice and they were going to support right. them in their choice. And that is that was my last straw. That's when I finally quit and and started. It takes wow. a family. Um, so we need to understand that these people and this movement is is founded on depravity. And, and they know it. And so they, they practice this linguistic theft. They practice, you know, redefining terms and, mm -hmm. and using all, these pos all this positive language to deceive yeah. the public that they're doing something good. That's right. Now, one of the questions that I get a lot, Seth, is, well, what about children who don't have family? Like, they're like, Monica, you, you have it takes a family. You want this for, for kids who, you know, they already have families. But what about those children who don't have families or who are in the foster system? And yep. here's my answer to that. Again, going to scripture as Christians, God tells us that we are to be there for the orphans and the widows. Orphans actually means fatherless. 
uh, right. without the male presence, without the male protector and provider. Same for the widow, not having that male presence. And so it's, but God also calls women to mentor people, younger women, younger girls. And so to me, if we are coming across children who have been neglected or in the foster care system, it is not to then say, oh, you know, you're already in a bad position, so we're just going to give you even more bad education and expose you to comprehensive right. sexuality education and abortion. No, it means that we are to come alongside those children and protect them and become their mentors and become their, Amen. you know, be there for them. And that is it's a call that we have to do. And so even at school board uh, meetings, whether I share my faith or not in some of those places, I emphasize to them, these children, just like every other child that's being protected by, the ch- by their parents, these children also deserve to be protected. We are not mm-hmm. going to add abuse on top of abuse. And exactly. so we are called to help those children as well. Hmm. Amen. That's powerful. I... <sighs> One thing that, uh, going along with what you said, Monica, about Alfred Kinsey and these underlying ideas that animate the actions of the culture of death and Planned Parenthood, I want to add on one other thing, and and I'm assuming you're familiar with this as well, but I think it's worth pointing out for our listeners. There's a very old heresy that's been labeled a heresy by the church, and it's been a position that's been held by secular humanists um, and leftists, if you want to use that term, for, for really thousands of years. And it's called Gnostic dualism or body self dualism. And body self dualism can be traced all the way back to people like Plato. Um, and body self dualism says that the real you is not your body. The real you is your soul, your your feelings, your aims, your consciousness, your desires. That's the real you. So these bodies that we have and that we see one another with, I'm not actually looking at you, Monica. I'm that this body you're in is just a shell and you will one day vacate it and it has nothing to do with the real you. And this belief has animated racists, it's animated eugenicists, and it's animated the pro-abortion movement. It also animates those focused on sexual indoctrination because it says, if it feels good, do it. Because guess what? Whatever behaviors you do with your body don't impact harm or help the real you. It's completely uh, random because the real you is your soul. So sleep with as many people as you want, abort as many babies as you want, children have a right to sexual desires because it's just a body that's created for pleasure that's not the real you. And this is a very dangerous belief and it leads to the justification of abortion because they say the unborn's body is not really them. It leads to the justification of people like Alfred Kinsey, who says, this is just a body of a child. It's not the actual person. And so I just want everyone to be aware of that, that this is the belief that animated people like Alfred Kinsey and others. But we believe, certainly from a Christian worldview, that we are embodied human beings. We are both body and soul. Christ, God, becomes human in a human body and remains human to this day. He rises bodily, and we will one day rise bodily too. We are embodied human beings. The theological term for this is hylomorphism, uh, that there is a unity between the body and the soul. And if you don't view the human person like that, then sure, right? Abuse their bodies. It doesn't matter because it's just a shell and it's not harming the real them. Uh, And that's a very dangerous view, and it's one that's been labeled a heresy by the church. So just a sort of worldview aside for all of you guys to be aware aware of. But Monica, I want you to dive in and share a little bit more about the practical aspects of this education. Okay, so I'm in California. We've got some gnarly sexual education in our public schools in California, and we can dive into that. But you've talked about sort of the animating beliefs behind this. You've talked about the goals of it, which is a sales funnel to get students through the revolving door of sexual health care services as they're engaging in the sexual debauchery, debauchery that Planned Parenthood curriculum encourages them to do so. Um, but specifically, when this is being taught in schools, and, and, and don't worry if you need to be graphic, we, we've, we've warned our listeners, we want parents to understand, right? What are they teaching exactly? Um, and at what age does this start in some of these public high schools or, or elementary schools? Uh, when does this start? And what does this education actually entail? So this education is starting very, very early because of this belief that children are sexual from birth. Um, Many Planned Parenthood, Advocates for Youth, Amaze.org, never look at those YouTube videos with your children present. They are incredibly graphic 
graphic. And again, very talented animators. Um, if you just mm -hmm. looked at it, you would think, what a fun looking cartoon, but they're, they're teaching self-stimulation. They're teaching to consider that you might be another gender. I mean, it goes on and wow. I think it's very, very graphic. And these are all yeah. targeted for children. And so really they're they're also trying to have education for parents to teach them to teach their children about their body parts and about pleasure at a very young age so they're trying to reach parents to convince them to teach this to their toddlers the next wow. thing that they're doing is then going into the preschools and the human rights campaign and this is not the only program there's oh yeah there's other programs out there, but I'm just going to touch on this one. The Human Rights Campaign has a program called Welcoming Schools, and it's considered, and Human Rights Campaign, if, if your listeners don't know, is a gay organization. And this anti-bullying program called Welcoming Schools is to teach children not to bully. But what it's really teaching is that there are all kinds of families, including homosexual families and polyamory families and all, you know, that, and that love is love. So they begin to indoctrinate preschool and kindergarten about these different families, uh, about the transgender uh, movement as well, so that they're not bullying um, their fellow peers in the schools, supposedly. Right. And so that is that beginning. Um, many of these teachers, if because they're being they're they're also being groomed into believing these things, um, I've heard cases of teachers who identify with same sex attraction. Uh, bringing in their their sex partner with them and and oh hugging and kissing that partner in wow. front of the children and maybe it's a peck you know I don't know how far you know but but just to show affection between the same yeah. sex married couple and so the children are being groomed to accept these um, these different kinds of relationships but that's not the only thing that they're teaching them, Seth, not only are they sexualizing them, but then they're telling them to be an activist for this community because you don't want to be a bigot. You don't want to be a hater. You want to show right. love. And again, right. this is that linguistic theft is, is teaching love and acceptance um, all the while they're abusing these children. And they don't, and welcoming schools, because it's an anti-bullying program in a public school, they don't have to tell parents that they're bringing in this program. It's not like wow. sex education where you actually have to notify parents. Right. This is anti-bullying. It's it's not necessary yeah. to, by law, to tell parents about Jeez. it. So parents have no idea it's happening. Yeah. And so it is starting at a very young age. Now, another thing that, that parents need to know about is that these organizations have collaborated to create education standards for our schools. And they have come up with uh, edu sexuality education standards, and they've given it a very good name that makes it sound like it's of official. They call it the na yeah the National Sexuality Education Standards, and they work closely with the CDC. And so what they've done is they're very clever. They've created these standards to match education standards. And so basically they deliver these standards to the public schools, to private schools, to Christian schools and say, look how this aligns with education standards. And this aligns with the education standards of your state. You can implement these. And these are standards where they basically are grooming children from preschool all, the, all through high school on their philosophy of relationships and marriage and, and just kind of just what their beliefs are. Right. And we, again, need to be careful because our legislators need to know not to accept this into our education standards in our schools. Right. Um, right. Your board members, your superintendents, many of these are elected officials. We need to be careful who we are electing. And really, I encourage your listeners that pray about it, but maybe you, a strong Christian conservative, can be running for some of these positions because Amen. we need leadership within Come our on. education system to ensure that our children are safe. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, one thing I talk a lot about on my show, Monica, is this, uh, frankly, um, idolatrous obsession within the church of um, not compromising our witness. So people say, I couldn't vote for Trump or I don't vote at all because of my witness. Because if my leftist friends who hate God learn that I voted for a Republican, they'll say, 
I hate you and I don't want to have anything to do with your Republican God, <laughs> as if that's why we're engaging in politics, right? And so I, I love what you just said. Amen. If you're a parent listening to this, uh, heed um, Monica's um, encouragement. Uh, pray about running for local um, city council or for school boards uh, to prevent this type of demonic, heretical, um, ideological propaganda from, from impacting your children. Listen, and for those of you guys who have children, I have a toddler. Um, half the time, my son is actually convinced that he's a Jedi, Monica. Uh, and if I were to yes. affirm that belief um, for long enough, he, he would eventually believe it. And then I guess, you know, I'd be forced to go uh, by the state through a Jedi transition surgery, um, which would be, you know, incredibly harmful. Um, but this is the, this is the type of um, ideas that they're pushing on to young people. I mean, children will believe anything and they look to adults as the wise individuals to direct their understanding of the world. And we as Christians seemingly won't do for good what the other side vociferously will do for evil, what they will passionately do for evil. Um, but as long as this is a constitutional republic, uh, we all have the ability to involve ourselves in the public square, uh, to promote righteousness and good ideas and human flourishing um, and restrain evil and evildoers. Um, so if this is, is disturbing any of you guys, please consider running for, for city council and school boards. So, Monica, I'm in California, the once great state, the once great conservative state, uh, which hasn't been for a long time. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Planned Parenthood helped co-write the sexual education curriculum in, in a lot of these public high schools, which it's just, it just still blows my mind that this is starting with preschoolers and kindergartners. It's just unbelievable. And I saw some of the graphics that were depicted in the sexual education when it was initially getting pushed in California. It's incredibly sick. Um, so talk to us a little bit about um, California. Talk to us about um, what Planned Parenthood, um, how they work at, I guess, a higher level with even like county health departments. And, and school boards. Um, and do you, do you have any updates for us in terms of their new push? What, what are the frontline updates with what Planned Parenthood is doing in states like California or other more liberal states across the country? Yeah, you know, they, uh, unfortunately, yes, you know, I love your state. I have so many friends in California who are fighting this. Yeah. And, uh, but unfortunately, because of the move that California has done, I mean, they, they, they have been able to push this very, very far. Um, basically, other states are adopting what California has done, you know, so they're duplicating what was done in California in different states so that every state is right. going to have the same type of education. Um, you know, what we're seeing in California, again, is that they are being very profound in their education. It's not just the sex education class that they take, but they are pushing these beliefs in every single subject. So history class, they talk about um, they talk about adult and child sex, and they say, well, it's just part of Roman history, so that's why we talk about it. They talk about polyamory, but well, it's just part of history. Um, you know, so they're justifying teaching children these very depraved values and calling it good. And that's right. the difference is that they're not talking about history necessarily, but they're actually calling it good and they're encouraging children and they're, wow. and they're using a lot of what we're seeing in Black Lives Matters. We're seeing um, all of these different resources being brought into the school to mold the minds of our children yeah. and parents, if they're, busy and normal parents are busy working yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and not knowing what their children are learning, their children are just going to, you know, this is why it's so important um, that I teach parents and that parents, uh, you know, you don't need me to teach you this, but if you need help, certainly reach out. But this is why it's so important to have conversations with your children. Um, allow them to have little debates with you because you're going to find out what they're learning at school. That's and when right. you start to hear what they've been taught, then you have an opportunity to then teach mm -hmm. them truth, absolute truth, and bring them back to where they need to be uh, and giving them the words that they need to be able to combat this at the school. Right. I know my son did that. A lot of times we wondered if he was even listening and then he would come back a month later or so, or a few weeks later, just really proud that he was able to have a very good conversation about certain issues because he had learned from yeah. us. Yeah. And so it's important that we engage our children this way. You know, again, in California, some of the things that I've seen that are continuing 
are the school-based health centers, you know, those clinics within mm. the schools. What right. I'm seeing is uh, the company that I used to work for, Cardia, you know, they're training teachers how to get children to leave the school, to go to a clinic and make sure that the parents don't find out about it. Um, you know, and again, this is all very dangerous because if a child gets an abortion or a child gets some kind of the, you know, implant of a birth control in her arm or something like right. that, and something goes wrong, the parent has no idea what's going on. Number one, right. that's not ethical. It should not be legal for that right. to happen. Number two, Wild. it places that child at, at great risk because the parent, and this has actually happened where a mother, um, her daughter got an infection. She was very sick for a few days. The mother had no idea what was going on. The, the daughter was afraid to tell her what she had done. And what she had done was that her school transported her to a, a I don't know if it was a Planned Parenthood or not, but she did go to a place like that and had Implanon put into her arm and it got infected. And oh so for God. days, this little girl endured this pain and, and had this infection. Finally, she, she told her mom, her mom was able to get her the health care that she needed. This is very, very dangerous. And so, you know, not just in California, but what we're seeing, Seth, is I want your, your listeners to, they can Google this. It's on the CDC it is whole community, whole school, whole child. And it's this virtual school on the CDC. And I'm seeing this happen all over the nation. And they have a logo that represents this program, whole school, whole community, whole child. And it is popping up on all of the school district's websites. And what this mm -hmm. is, is that you can take a tour of the virtual school on the CDC website and they want to have a general practitioner, a mental health provider, a dentist. Um, you wow. can see posters on the wall about diversity. They want extended school hours. They want the children to be at school there earlier, leave later. Basically, they're institutionalizing our children and they're integrating wow. social emotional learning, which brings in all these ideologies as the culture of the school, not just a class, but a whole culture. Oh, my God. Now, this, does this sound like conspiracy theory? All you have to do is Google the program I'm talking about and you'll see it for yourself. And then you'll see that that logo is showing up in every school. Once again, these are things that we need to be on top of and talking to our legislators um, and getting involved. And at some point, if you feel, you know, many parents, many parents and, and many people that I speak in the church, they say, I don't want to be involved in controversy. I'm afraid to speak up. This is too hard. Right, right. Um, now, imagine, imagine that you're teaching a child all of your beliefs as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And now imagine that it's not you that's at school eight hours a day, but that it's your child at school eight hours a day. You've That's taught right. them your Christian beliefs, but yet they're there in the midst of controversy being told to drop those beliefs, to change right. their beliefs or else, because that is That's what right. it is. You are, and it happened to my own son, is that he was labeled as not being sensitive. He was very wow. hateful. He was very mean because he, because he refused to become an activist for the LGBTQ community. Now, That's luckily right. my son is a nonconformist. And so he went to one of his friends who identified with same-sex attraction, a, a young man, and he asked him, he said, are we friends? And he said, yes, we're friends. He said, well, then do you need me to be part of this, you know, day of silence for the LGBTQ community to prove my friendship to you? And he said, no. He said, well, good, because I'm not going to do it, but I'm still your friend. Now, wow. my son just has a strong personality and was able to do that. Yeah. But he, you know, even though he was strong, he still came home and it really bothered him that his peers and his teachers were labeling him as being an, uh, an you know, insensitive person for refusing to be part of this program or this, you right. know, day of silence. So this is why I tell parents why it's important that they do speak up because they're basically putting their child out into the world defenseless, not yeah. being able to defend themselves. And That's so right. as pastors and as Christians and as parents, we are the ones that are to protect them and speak for them. So because that is too hard of a, too heavy of a burden for them to be doing for themselves. Yeah. And so when they see us as Christians and as pastors and as parents, you know, speaking up and being leaders in our homes and in our communities, then they know that they're safe and they, they know that they're going to be right. supported. Amen. That's right. And, you know, this is, this is a full-scale assault on the family. 
Um, and most individuals in our country, even if they're not people of faith, right, Monica, even if they're not a, a Protestant or a Catholic, don't agree with this type of stuff. Of course, you always have your segment of the population that are radically left and they're on both, primarily on both coasts of the country. But most individuals, uh, even if they're, you know, pagan atheists who hate God, would not raise their children this way. Most individuals, if they saw their neighbor showing this type of curriculum and linguistic bigotry to their children, would probably punch their neighbor in the face. If someone was showing this to my son and talking to him about this, I would punch them. I would punch them. And, I, and then I would tell the judge, I think you would have punched this guy too. <laughs> I mean, but, but we've institutionalized it. We've called it healthcare. We've called it anti-bigotry. We've called it anti-bullying. And then most of the public just goes right along with it. It's crazy. Um, and so you, you guys, you need to wake up. Th these people hate your children. They hate you. They think you're a bigot. And they want to indoctrinate your children in a way that views parents as bigots. And one of the ways we know this um, is how far they're willing to take their targeting of children. Right, Monica? So um, you want to talk a little bit about judicial bypasses and how Planned Parenthood also coaches children on not only um, how, to, how to have sex, how to get birth control, how to get emergency contraception without their parents knowing, but then if they get pregnant and they're a minor, how to get an abortion without their parents knowing. That's right. So the judicial bypasses, basically Planned Parenthood, uh, and now there's other nonprofits who do this work for them, they will take that minor and get them legal representation transport them, take them to the court, and help them to, to be granted a judicial bypass to get an abortion without parental consent. Um, and this is happening all over our country. Here in Texas, it was Planned Parenthood that was doing it for themselves. Eventually, Jane's Due Process was formed in Texas, and so now Jane's Due Process provides that. Now the city of Austin is a very, uh, the city of Austin uh, city council is very, very liberal, socialist actually. And they have yeah. decided to donate, they're not allowed to donate money to abortion providers because of the laws that we've created in Texas. Um, taxpayer money and, and government funding cannot go to abortion. And so the city council got creative and said, fine, then we're gonna, you know, we're going to fund James due process and help children get judicial bypasses so that uh, they can get abortion wow. or anything else they want. So that is in the works. But another thing that, that we need to be aware of is the obscenity laws. You know, earlier, Seth, you were talking about being in front of a judge and saying, hey, no one can show my children these kind of things. Well, that is true. We have a law called the obscenity law that yep. you, it is against the law to show children pornographic materials, sexual material to children. But about, I believe it's 43 states, um, that might not be correct, but I believe 43 states have something called an obscenity exemption, which is a loophole that basically says that you can show obscene material to children as long as it's for educational value. Oh so gosh. our public schools, our public schools are under the obscenity exemption. You know, so who thought, you know, Ridiculous. who's the, the person who thought that up, right? Um, and all of this, again, is inspired by Alfred Kinsey's work, um, yep. is to be able to sexualize children. And why children? Because when we can get to the children, we can change generations, right? That's right. Um, Nailed it. So uh, many times, again, when, when parents are parents or pastors are so concerned about talking about these things because oh they gosh. feel like they're targeted, right. I remind them, you are actually not their target. They could care right. less about you. They know that the adults, especially Christian adults, are not going to bend their way. They're targeting wow. your children, and then they can change generations of people. That's right. So, um, again, that's wow. something to talk to your legislators about is do we have an obscenity exemption and can we repeal it, repeal right. the obscenity exemption in your state? Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing clarity to that, Monica. A lot of people don't know that. I think that's super important. And listen, if you're a pastor, if you're a lay pastor, if you're an elder, like, we say pastors are shepherds, right, Monica? We're shepherds. Okay, well, if, 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 if you're a shepherd, then you have a flock. And if wolves are daily attacking your flock and they're murdering the sheep and you can't protect them and you're unable or unwilling, then you are, by definition, a bad shepherd. And I know I'm speaking, I'm speaking very, you know, almost uh, pastors say, oh, you can't talk, you can't judge the pulpit just on cultural issues. Yes, I can. If you can't protect your flock and you're unable or unwilling to do so and your sheep are getting slaughtered, 
then we, we should get better shepherds. And so this is a wake-up call for pastors and for the church um, to begin protecting the most vulnerable among us, preborn children first, but also minors who are too young to understand what is happening to them and how they're being targeted. But this, I think, fits into the larger strategy of the left, and you know this, Monica, the, the, the manipulation of language to achieve political goals. And George Orwell predicted this, prophesied this in his seminal novel, 1984. But, you know, words are pointers. Words refer to something, right? If I say dog, I don't mean cat. If I say woman, I don't mean man. Words are pointers. They refer to something in reality, in real time and space. So if you take a word like abortion, murdering a baby, and you call it reproductive health care, well, we're not talking about the same thing anymore. If you talk about indoctrinating children and telling them to masturbate at eight years old, um, you're not talking about anti-bullying. That's not health care. Um, but if you control words, you control minds. And if you redefine words for long enough, that inculcates the next generation with a certain vision of what the left calls the good life of human flourishing. But it's not human flourishing, it's human decay. And we're normalizing it and we're accepting it and that needs to change. But that's what George Orwell talked about, right? In 1984, he says, every book has been rewritten, every word has been redefined, and the big brother state is in control. Uh, and we're watching that happen, I think, increasingly. Um, so I, as we sort of sort of maybe start wrapping up here, Monica, and I want, I want to give you a chance to say anything that you'd like to say to any marching orders for our listeners. But one thing that I've been shocked at, and I have sort of some reasons why I think why, but I'd love to hear your answer. And I think, I think this is on a lot of our listeners' minds. Why is it that, that the Democratic Party is still so blindly in love with Planned Parenthood? Um, despite the fact that we know they sold dead baby body parts on the black market, breaking federal law doing so, we know that they push sexual education, graphic, radical sexual education that most Democratic members of the House of Representatives probably wouldn't have their children go through. We know that they refuse to report states, cases of statutory rape and sex trafficking. Live actions expose that over and over again. And we know that they try to sexualize children. We know that they sue pro-life states for every common sense um, piece of legislation, you know, that tries to like cater to the health of women, like not having the abortion pill be shipped to your mailbox via snail mail uh, because you could have an ectopic pregnancy or you could be further along than you think you are. Or remember the Louisiana bill uh, that uh, last year that um, in June medical versus Rousseau that said abortion clinics should be held to the same medical standards as every other ambulatory surgical center in the state. And Planned Parenthood always trods out a lawsuit against bills that just say we want to cater to the health of women getting abortion. So why do you think this is? What's your opinion on this? Why do you think Democrats are still so blindly in love with Planned Parenthood despite all of these horrific things we know about them that don't even have to do with abortion? Um, you know, as someone who lived behind the doors of sex education before I became a Christian, I was that person. I was the person who believed those things. Um, I was the person that even though something in the back of my mind thought, mm, I don't think we really are supporting these women who are being brought in by their pimps. I think we should mm. save them. But I was easily told, no, but this is how we serve. And so I think there's a lot of different uh, ways that it's being, that it's happening. I think some people truly believe that this is true compassion and love, that we are, that this is the best anyone can, can hope for. And so we just need to provide this service because these poor people um, don't know any better. And I think that that is quite a sin. It's to believe that a person cannot be more. Um, and that is what I talk about a lot is that when God met me where I was at, because I was just like those people, I didn't just teach this kind of education. I was living it out in my own life. I had an unplanned pregnancy. I canceled my abortion by the grace of God. And I have a son today. Um, but I grace was God. that person. And, and what I tell people is that God met me where I was at, and it was not a pretty place, but instead of leaving me there like Planned Parenthood would, did, God said, I value you, and I want more for you, and he brought me to a better place. He wanted me to flourish as a human and as a mother and as a woman, and he changed my life. And so I think that for some people, they think they're actually helping people. The reality is that they don't realize that they're leaving them where they're at, and they're 
are allowing them to have a slow death by engaging in sexual activity, promiscuity, and drug use. Mm. I think there are others who actually believe that those people over there, that that's the best they could ever have, and wow. they're just going to leave them there. Wow. I've actually met even some Christians who have said that abortion is a necessary evil for some people, and those some people yep. usually are the impoverished, uh, right. the lost. Uh, but that is not what God calls us to. God, you know, Jesus came for the lost. He didn't want yeah. to leave them there. He met the woman at the well, but he did not leave her there. He met the woman who was about to be stoned. He did not leave her there. He met Zacharias, who was stealing money, <laughs> and he did not leave him there. And so yeah. as Christians, we need to be doing the same thing. We cannot leave him there. And so this is why praying for abortion providers, praying for the people who or getting these services, praying even for those far left people, which I know is really hard to do, but we don't want to fall into the same sin that Jonah did, where he's like, I don't want to have a blessing or grace for the Ninevites. That's right. <laughs> Totally. You know, we, 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 all can, we can all relate to Jonah, right? Um, but it's important that as, as Christians that we, we are asking God for his grace and mercy upon those people, but we also fight. We also continue this fight to, to help these people. Um, you know, when I, I've actually met eye to eye with some lesbian mothers who have children that, that identify with same-sex attraction, and they were fighting for comprehensive sexuality education in Austin. I was there speaking, um, trying to convince them otherwise. And I looked them in the eyes because there's something that I know about the gay community. Majority of them have been abused. I have been part of their private meetings, their friendships, mm -hmm. all of that. And when the gay community embraces young gay children, they hypersexualize them. I know this because I was there watching it happen. And so I looked at these mothers in their eyes and I said, your children deserve are better than this. They deserve to be innocent. They do not deserve to be sexualized. Just because That's they right. identify with this, with same-sex attraction, doesn't mean that they should be exposed to sex, to sex toys, to lubrication. Yeah. And these mothers at first were angry, and then they started to soften. Their faces started to soften because as mothers, they started to realize, what am I doing to my child? And I know it's because it's what's happened to them, uh, what happened to them when they were young. And so we need to be able to remember that a lot of these people are coming from a place of pain, and they yeah. are broken, and they don't know the truth the way we know the truth. Um, now, some of them you'll be able to convert, some you will not. But... For me, I am doing this for all children and all families, and I believe that this ministry that I have with the Tixa family will bring people to Christ and that we will see whole families coming back to Christ. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is something that I truly believe in, which, which is my closing thought, is that although we're sounding the alarm set, the truth is, is we also need to be teaching our, as you were saying, as shepherds, you know, as pastors over their flock, is teaching our families what God's creation for humanity really is. That's and right. so when I talk to parents about how to talk to their children about sex, then you, it, the truth is it's a lifelong conversation, and it starts when they're very young. I'm not talking about sexualizing children. I'm talking about yeah. teaching our ch children from when they're very young what it means to be male and female in God's eyes, his That's creation right. for the husband and the wife, his creation for mother and father and children. And when yeah. we teach them what marriage is at a very young age, in just as God says in his wonderful, in, in the Bible, then it's very easy for us to be able to explain to them sexual intimacy is to be within the context of marriage. Um, right. and, and so we need to be able to teach our children that truth. That's, and, and for many of us adults, we need to learn it for the first time because it's something that we haven't been taught uh, in a way that we know how to explain. Um, and so I think that that is something a call to action is to start digging into the word, to start talking about God's creation for humanity, because when our children and the adults know that absolute truth, they will be able That's to right. discern the lie in the world. Amen. That's right. Totally. And, and God's truth always bears out in reality, doesn't it? And so even though um, people might not want to live the way we're living or live according to the biblical sexual ethic that we recommend, 
um, those results always bear out in the real world. And this is why children who are raised by a married biological mother and father and don't have sex until they're married um, and don't uh, have children outside of wedlock fare better in pretty much every societal category. Uh, and this has been examined multiple times in multiple studies, both longitudinal and over time, um, that show that because the, 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 this reality reflects God's design, as you said, and his purpose for the human person and for human flourishing. But I like what you said, Monica. I think Nancy Piercy made this point once. She said, you know, we, we should have compassion um, for those we disagree with because they're the victims of bad ideas. Um, and bad ideas do have victims. Um, and so, and, and in our conversation, that would be the children. Um, but we also, like you said, we have to engage in that fight. We can't just look at the other side and have compassion for them and pray for them. We also have to contend and fight because there are people on the other side who, whether they understand the ideas they've absorbed or not, they're using those ideas to target children. Um, and, and the question becomes, who's going to stand against that? Who's going to protect the youngest, the most vulnerable among us? And, and I, I believe that there is a segment of people on the left, Monica, and I, and I believe this firmly, who use the sexualization of children in order to control American politics. Because when you appeal to people's most debased desires, our most animalistic desires, and tell them, just go do it. Whatever feels good, do it. It's fine. It doesn't affect you at all. Have fun. Th that prevents rational and logical thinking. A and when people are just focused on pleasure all the time, they won't be focused on much else. <laughs> We've seen that with people who are sexual addicts, drug addicts, alcoholos, alcoholics. You're not going to be focused on much else. And so you're, you're going to solidify a lifelong voting block through promises of sexual libertation and sexual freedom. You've told this next generation to, if it feels good, do it, since what, since the 60s, since the sexual revolution. They have lived their lives, their lives according to that lie, and then they're told by the left that all these Christian bigots want to control your freedom, and your freedom is grounded in your sexual identity. Well, that, that group of people in Americans becomes a very manipulative um, voting bloc. Whose, whose action and voting you can always get by treating them as the victim class and those pesky Republicans and Christians as bigots. Um, and so I think there's, a, there's an even nastier level of this sexualization of our children um, in terms of their political goals. Um, and, and it's about time we start standing against that. Well, uh, Monica, as we wrap up, um, why don't you just give us marching orders? What can parents, um, single people um, or young people who are not married or maybe they're just starting to date, um, but they're disturbed by everything we just talked about. Um, what can they do to fight back and tell them how they can connect with you? Yeah, well, I, again, I believe it's learning absolute truth. And so one of the things that I've been doing through It Takes a Family that has been really effective Active is my table talks. And so because I believe in family, and, and this is coming from a, a, a single mother. I was a single mother for nine years. And um, and, and God, as in Isaiah 54, he is my husband. You know, so he, I had the grace, greatest spouse. It was God himself <laughs> taking <laughs> care of us. Um, and so, I, but I believe in family. And, and so what I do with It Takes a Family is we have these sit-down dinners. And just last Friday, I had over 40 families. We shared a meal together. Wow. I talked to them about what is going on. And then we have open discussion. They can ask questions and we go back and forth. And then you can, you know, invite me for, for more specific talks on like maybe let's just talk, talk about the transgender sh issue or whatever it is. But Seth, what I'm finding from these talks is number one, it's really lifting up the dads. The dads are getting that permission back to 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 engage their children on these conversations, to stand up. That it's not just the moms going to the school, but that dads right. are going to do it too. So that's been great. I've also learned from the millennials and the Gen Z population that they want an ideal for marriage. And they have literally right. said that. They hate what they here is happening and they with this on the table said we want an ideal for marriage we want an ideal for family so i really believe just like the pro-life generation that we're seeing these young people who are pro-life i'm seeing that many young people are really saying we're tired of this risk reduction message we really want to know about healthy relationships right. and not about sex necessarily 
They, they yeah. want to know about the ideal for marriage and family. And these are really great opportunities for you to do this with people that you know, like your friends um, in, in an intimate setting. It's not a conference. It's not a workshop, although those are good too. But to be able to sit at the table and have these conversations together. Um, yeah. and, and again, the other marching order is to be involved politically. You know, if you start to combat this in your community because you see that it's happening, follow my podcast, The Monica Klein Show. I, I tell you lots of different places that you need to be looking like your electronic awesome. library at your schools that have pornography, the books yeah. in your library. I mean, there's so much to look into. Um, wow. So you start to discover this. What do you do? The next step is to get like-minded parents in your community to come with you. Because the truth is, is when you start fighting this, they will come and they will attack you. It will not be right. easy. So you need to be girded by more parents and hopefully families of faith that will come together and combat this together in with one voice. Don't do it by yourself. And then start engaging your legislators as well as, you know, considering running for office. Yeah. But even if you don't run for office, you need to be working with your legislators and letting them know, congratulate them when they're when they're authoring a bill that protects yeah. family authority or protects children from, you know, sex surgeries and things like that. Go and support them, but also, you know, uh, testify. You know, there, there's just so many different things that we can be doing. But I think number one for me is parents get equipped, get educated on these cultural mm. issues. I would love to help you do that. That's and right. then have those discussions at home with your children because they truly are waiting for you to mm. leave. They, you are, even the polls, many polls show that children say it's their parents who are their greatest influencers on, right. on their decisions about sex and relationships. Yeah. Well, it's almost as if that's how God intended it, huh, Monica? What a, what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so, so much, uh, Monica. You guys, uh, go follow Monica Klein. It's uh, ittakesafamily.org. Go over to ittakesafamily.org. Um, follow her on, on Facebook. Follow her podcast, The Monica Klein Show. Uh, C-L-I-N-E is how you spell her last name. So go connect with her. Uh, Monica, we're going to get you back behind enemy lines uh, here in the once great state of California soon uh, and drop you in for some subterfuge um, uh, political family work to fight against the culture of death. So keep up the great work. Thanks for coming on the show. We'll have you back soon. And uh, we stand behind you. Keep fighting. Thank you, Seth. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today. Um, if you appreciate the show, head on over to iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, give the show a rating and review. Let us know what you think. It really helps. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H. G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to get training videos, and to see my speaking schedule if you want to come hear me speak live and local, or to book me for an event. My summer is already getting filled up, and we want to get into your church, your youth group, your school, your conference. It's time to fight back against the culture of death. If we as the church don't stand now against this culture of death, targeting both born and pre-born, children. Uh, we may not be able to stand. Uh, again, there, in, there is an assault on our natural rights, our natural liberties, and the nuclear family. And that starts at the local level, and we want to help you engage locally. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Go follow Monica. We'll be back next week with a whole lot more. Until then, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs>